dirt cheap, it's because it ain't nothing but cheap dirt. That's something my pastor said in a sermon when I was in my teenage years. And that statement has stuck with me throughout life and I'm 40 years old. <laughs> now, of course, he was talking about the cost of something versus quality. And of course, we all understand that anything that's valued as dirt is worthless. And what's so strange about the statement is that in gardening, like dirt is the most valuable commodity. Your garden is only as good as the soil in which it's growing. So let's talk about dirt or soil and why it's the one thing that you need to spend a lot of money on in your garden. If you're listening to this podcast, I'm sure that you're probably watching any number of YouTube videos on gardening. Hopefully you're watching my YouTube videos. But if you do, you're probably familiar with some of the terms that I'm going to throw out about soil, you know, and the terms that are commonly thrown out really talk about different aspects of the soil. And it may not be clear, especially if you're not new to gardening, kind of what each of the problem areas is really addressing. So, so that you understand, you know, what the soil is, what, what its components are, and so that way you know what exactly you need to fix if there's a problem, we're going to break this into two big categories. So the first is soil structure, and the second is soil condition. Okay, so... Let's talk about the first one, which is the structure of soil. So there are three main types of soil, sand, clay, and salt. Now what is sand? Well, you've probably seen sand at the beach. Um, of all the types of dirt, it has got the largest particle size. They're very large. As a matter of fact, you can, they're visible with a naked eye. And one thing about sand is that, you know, if it gets wet, like it doesn't form a smooth shape. You can't like make a ball out of it. Um, the water kind of goes right through it. And it's just very, um, it's e especially when it's dry, it's very easy to run your, your hands through. And then you have clay, which is what most people are probably familiar with. Now, this type of dirt, these are the smallest particles of dirt. When it gets wet, it gets very heavy, it's sticky, like you can shape it into a ball. Uh, when it dries, it hardens, it's like compact. And then last but not least, we have silt. And I remember when I was younger learning about silt in a science class, it was kind of like, I guess what you would call like sediment, like, you know, when the, you know, the rivers are kind of breaking down the mountains and rushing by, you know, streams, like, you know, that kind of just wears that dirt away. It's just, it's the size of particles are between sand and clay. It does, it holds moisture better than sand. Um, it doesn't quite compact like clay. You know, when it's very wet, like it makes a runny mud puddle and of the three, silt tends to be the most fertile. So these three types of soil combine to make what's known as loam. So loam is very fertile, it's easy to work with. You know, it retains moisture, but it does drain well. And this is what you're going for in a garden. You really want loam. You want your soil to be loam. You know, now loam does have different percentages of clay, sand, and silt. And so if you're here, if you hear people talk about like, you know, loams, they'll say it's like a clay loam or, you know, a silt loam. It's talking about which, which particular component is, uh, has the highest percentage in the, in the loam. So how do you know which one you have? Well, I think a relatively simple test is like the drain hole test. So what you do is like go out, like if you're going to put a plant in or something, dig a hole in the ground. Uh, like for example, if you're going to plant a rose, like dig a, like a rose size hole, then fill it with water. And you want to watch to see how quickly it drains. Okay, what you don't want, you don't want that hole to take longer than an hour to drain. If you if it takes longer than an hour to drain, you know, you got you got problem with your soil. That's indication of clay soil, 
that's a problem. It's going to retain moisture. You're going to get root rot. You do not want that. Then, of course, if you have soil that drains like in a hot second, that's sandy soil. Okay, that's, well, it'll reduce root rot, but it causes other issues, especially like if you're in an area where it gets a little, really hot, that water is not going to, it's not going to retain the moisture. So, you know, what you're, you should be looking for, uh, what you want is the water to drain from the hole, I would say within like, you know, 15 to 45 minutes. It means that, you know, you have moisture retention, but it does drain. So that's the structure, that's the structure of your soil. And then another thing you're probably going to hear about is the condition of your soil. When it comes to condition of the soil, if you've watched any gardening channel on YouTube, then the one you're probably most familiar with is pH. Because uh, you'll hear a gardener say, oh, my soil is acidic, or you'll hear them say, my soil is very alkaline. So I don't want to get too sciencey, but the pH scale measures the hydrogen ion concentration in a solution. Like, for example, if you were to dissolve it in water, the scale goes from 0 to 14. Anything less than 7 is acidic. Anything more than 7 is base or alkaline. Now, although there are some plants that are specifically adapted to either very acidic or very alkaline soils, most plants do best in neutral to slightly acidic soil. One of the things that I thought was interesting is that there is a correlation between the pH of your soil and the annual rainfall in your climate. And I learned this from the Sunset Magazine. It's a great gardening website. You should definitely check it out. So one of the things they were saying is that areas that get a lot of rain in the year tend to have acidic soil, whereas areas that get lower amounts of rainfall tend to have more alkaline soil. And I thought it was very interesting because, like, for example, where I am in Burlington County, New Jersey, we tend to have acidic soil. We grow, we grow, we have azaleas, rhododendrons, blueberry bushes, stuff that does well in acidic soil. And we also get we get a lot of water uh, during the year. You know, we really do. And then, like, for example, if you're on YouTube, there is this one uh, garden channel, and the gardener soil is alkaline. And one of the things that she has said was that they are high desert. They don't, I think she said at one point, they got like maybe 10 inches of rain or less. And I thought it was very interesting after you know, reading the article in Sunset that, oh, wow, there really is a correlation. So does it matter what your soil pH is? Well, yeah, kind of does. I mean, if you if there's anything, you definitely want to be a little bit more acidic. And there's a reason for that. Because with alkaline soils, just the chemical composition of them, it makes it very hard for the plant to take up nutrients. Okay? But if you're Acidic soil, your plant can uptake those nutrients, but of course you don't want it to be too acidic because then it's like it makes way too much of the nutrients in your soil available and then it just kind of, your, your plant just gets completely overwhelmed and it can languish. So to test your pH, you can use a home kit or you can set it to like your local county extension office. And so you can change the soil acidity, but if you're going to change your pH by more than one point, like if you're trying to take it from like, you know, I don't know, like let's just say for example, you had, you know, acidic soil at four, you wanted to bring it up to closer to like six and a half. That's one of those things you should definitely contact a professional to help you do. That's not something I would recommend you try doing it on your own. Because quite frankly, I don't even know how. Because I mean, the thing is, you it doesn't matter how much you amend it. You just may never be able to uh, get it that way. So they will be able to tell you whether or not it's worth doing that drastic of an amendment. So that's one thing, the pH. And then the other condition of the soil is the NPK, and I personally refer to this as NIPIC because that's what it looks like. Uh, but the N stands for nitrogen, uh, P stands for phosphorus, and K stands for potassium, and then you probably recognize those uh, initials from the periodic table. So these are like the main nutrients that plants need. 
Okay, and each of these nutrients does something different for the plant. And the way I've heard it, and I like to remember it, is that to keep them, like what they actually do is shoots, roots, and all around health. So um, nitrogen gives you that, like, you know, nice flush green growth, that phosphorus helps for root development and the, uh, the potassium is just, it's just to, to do, it's kind of like, I would say like a, almost like a multivitamin just kind of gives you, you know, helps all around health of the plant. So now I know, you know, you, if you're watching YouTube videos, like the, you know, the first thing every gardener is like, Oh, I'm just going to amend the soil, you know, well, that's fine. I mean, and you know, I mean, it's not any harm in how they're doing it. You know, but the thing is, you probably want to do some sort of test, especially if you don't really know what you have. Um, the reason that you want to do a test is because sometimes your soil, for any number of reasons, can be overly depleted in one nutrient. And if it's overly depleted, you know, you need to do something to kind of bring that into balance. So, like, how would your soil be overly depleted? So, for example, there is a young couple that I know that are starting a flower farm um, not too far from where I live. And so we met at a local farmer's market. And so we, you know, keep in contact and we chat. And the farm they bought, which is 10 acres, had originally been... I think it was like a corn farm or something, you know, but the thing is with the constant farming and growing crops and not to mention using commercial fertilizers, which that's going to be a different podcast, but they damage the soil. You know, the soil was very, very bad. It was just, it was bad. And so, you know, most of the nutrients had been, you know, depleted. So doing things like, you know, for example, putting compost, although that's good, uh, they needed to do some other things first, like they did cover crops, uh, because some of those cover crops actually do return a lot of nutrients to the soil. And so they knew that their soil was very, very depleted. So that could, you know, that could be a reason why you have a serious, like, nutrient imbalance. So before you start doing anything, you might want to get a test just to, just to make sure that you don't have a real imbalance. So that's your soil structure and condition. And so now, once you know all that stuff, then you can start amending your soil. Now, there are various amendments that people use to in their soil. And so I'm going to talk about the major ones and what they do. So the first one you've probably seen is peat moss. Uh, peat moss in, increases the soil's ability to retain moisture and nutrients and it also improves drainage and it absorbs a lot of water. As a matter of fact, I think it can absorb almost like 10, if not 20 times its weight in water. Uh, peat moss, from what I recall, as I recall, also does like acidify the soil because I know that if you're like, for example, growing blueberries, like especially if you're doing it in like a container, they recommend that you mix peat moss, like peat in to the soil to make sure that it's properly acidic. Um, the next amendment that you will have seen people talk about is soil compost and uh, manure. And these type of things, they enrich the soil, you know, by boosting fertility. They're adding a lot of biomatter. They have a lot of the nutrients that plants need. And it kind of, like, when you mix it in, I mean, it's one of those types of things that kind of slowly breaks it down over time and just improves the soil. It, you know, can help add, you know, some aeration and that sort of thing. But it's, I think people primarily use it to kind of, like, boost the fertility. Then you have soil conditioners. I think the one people probably hear about the most is gypsum. And you typically add it to soils, especially if you got clay, to prevent compaction. And so, you know, if your soil's been damaged, that's what you want to put in it to help, just help improve the health of the soil. Um, it helps you with drainage, aeration, and that sort of thing, especially when you add it to, like, potting soils. Then I'm sure you've seen things like perlite, uh, which is actually derived from a volcanic rock, and you use it to help improve water drainage and I think also just aeration 
And then you have like vermiculite and vermiculite helps improve soil retention and drainage. You probably use ver- vermiculite like if you're planting seeds a lot of times, especially if you have like really tiny seeds rather than burying them in the dirt, you'll put them on top of the dirt and just put a layer of vermiculite to help everything keep moist. And then you have lime. So lime is one of those things you've probably seen people use it if they're trying to change the color of their hydrangeas. And so it increases the pH. So I'm trying to think. I think if you want it to be pink, you want to add lime because it makes it a little bit more alkaline. Whereas if you want, for example, like with hydrangeas, if you want them to turn blue, you're going to make want to acidify the soil. And so typically what you use for that is sulfur. So it lowers the pH and it reduces the alkalinity, obviously. But by lowering the pH, it helps it helps it helps overcome the problem of plants not being able to uptake um, the nutrients. It's particularly with iron. Um, it just it just helps the plant. So that's probably what you're going to use if you've got alkaline soil is the sulfur. So in short, <laughs> uh, that's about dirt. That that's what you need to know about dirt. Uh, now that you understand the structure and you understand the condition hopefully that helps because you know when I first started actually even before I started gardening you know my mom liked to garden I didn't really understand anything about the soil I saw how our plants did it's not that they did bad but I do remember there were certain times where like I think one year she mended one of the beds with like blood meal and the plants she planted the next year I kid you not were like I think they were impatient, and I want to say that usually they were kind of short and maybe like eight to ten inches high. And I think that year, you know, they were like three feet tall. It was completely amazing. It was when I was in college and I started watching the Martha Stewart show, and she started talking about, you know, the soil and the and what your soil, how your soil needs to be, and this, that, and compost. That I realized that, you know my mom's plants could do better if we did something different with the soil. And so I do remember, I think it was right after I graduated from college, I convinced my mom to do a compost. And actually we were composting directly into the bed. And I remember it was like banana peels, egg, you know, eggshells, just all kinds of stuff we were, we were composting. And I do remember the next year when we came back, actually it was a little bit more than a year, we came back and my mom started planting in that bed. I do remember that the flowers in that bed were just much bigger. Uh, There was more earthworms. It just, the entire soil was just much healthier, we could tell. And so... Yeah, so that's when I realized just how how changing your soil makes a difference in your gardening. So what I just went over are the basic soil issues. So I'm not sure where everyone who's living this podcast is in the country or the world, but that will get you started on, you know, what you need to do if you're trying to you know, figure out this whole soil and gardening thing, because I know it can be very confusing. I try to keep it basic. I mean, obviously, you can spend a lot of time, you know, digging into the whole soil thing, but that's, you know, but that's the basic stuff that will identify, I think, the majority of whatever issues you're having, and just, it will address, I think it addresses most of the ways to fix any issues that you're going to be having in your garden. But now I'm going to talk to you about special considerations. So as I said before, I'm in Burlington County, which is in New Jersey. I am about 30 minutes away from Philly. And I don't know if this condition exists in New Jersey. It could. I live in a very rural area, uh, maybe in parts of New Jersey that have more like industry, you know, like refineries, that sort of thing. This could be an issue up there. And if you're living like, for example, in North Jersey, where I know there are a lot of refineries, this is definitely something you should look into. I just know it's in Philly because number one, Philly is not that far from me. And number two, I know there's a number of, there's at least one podcast that uh, I think is done out of the Rodell Institute, which is in Pennsylvania. And I know that this is an issue that has come up. But Philly has 
had a lot of lead smelting in the past. And that lead got spewed everywhere. And it has ended up in the ground. And so one consideration, if you're in the city of Philly, and particularly if you want to do something like, you know, growing food, especially if you're going to do in-garden bed, is that you need to get tested, you need to get your ground tested for lead. That's for several reasons. Because number one, if you're digging in the soil, you're going to be kicking that that lead up. Uh, It can get into your lungs and have an effect on you. Also, if you have children, I mean, I cannot, you know... I cannot state how detrimental to the development of children that lead is. I know that back in 2017, I had seen a number of newspaper articles where people were realizing that their children had gotten lead poisoning and it wasn't from like the old paint. It was actually from, you know, it was actually from the outdoors. Um, I know in some places, you know, in Philly, they're like revitalizing the area. So they're, you know, they're doing constructions, they're excavating and that stuff and it's kicking up that lead. So if you're in Philly and you want to, you know, you want to do a in ground bed, number one, get it tested. And number two, you're probably not going to be able to do an in ground vegetable garden. That's probably one of those things that you're going to have to do in raised bed. But you know, you want to, you want to make sure that you know, obviously buy new soil and that sort of thing, but it's just something to keep, it's just something to keep in mind because lead poisoning is no joke. So that is an issue that's more specific to the area that I live in. I don't know what other issues there may be in the U.S. I I just, I just don't know them all. Uh, that's maybe one of those things you can go to your local county extension. You could see if there's any, you know, gardening podcasts that are local to your area that may give you a better indication in terms of whether or not you have to worry about any, you know, widespread contaminants in your area from past, like, you know, uh, past, you know, operations in your geographic area. So that is it. So, I'm not really sure what the next topic on the podcast is going to be. I do apologize for not posting on a more regular basis. Life happens. <laughs> Life did happen in my case. But I did have a list of topics that I did want to go over. So I'm going to pull out that list and dust it off and pick the next topic. And I'm going to try to make the topics a little bit um, shorter and just do kind of general overviews and then you know later on if I there's certain aspects I need to go into in more detail then do it that way and hopefully that'll get me to post more regularly if the uh, podcasts are smaller so thank you guys for listening um I will see you guys in the next podcast Uh, don't forget to jump over to youtube and subscribe to the channel I have videos on what I'm doing in terms of my gardening within my new property, which I have named Wildfell Manor, and I have done a vegetable garden, I have created flower beds flanking my driveways, and um, I am already have plans drawn up for next year's garden, and I'm going to do another drafting video. So thank you guys so much for listening, and I will see you, or you'll hear me in the next podcast.